Um, so I'm here to talk about Donna. Donna is a company that I started with three friends just uh, about two and a half years ago. And we've had a really interesting adventure. And now we're owned by Yahoo. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about starting the company, about the product that we made, about some of our challenges, about the things I learned about starting a company and attracting talent, and about our transition to Yahoo. And this is not going to be like startups in Germany, and I don't think our story is even like most startups in the US, but hopefully it's an interesting story. So about me, I've started uh, writing code well in college, and then straight after college, I joined Netscape, which was bought by AOL. I even worked briefly in um, AOL iPlanet Germany, or Netscape iPlanet Germany in 2000. And um, there I worked on enterprise software, on webmail, and a little bit on the Mac client. After that, I spent seven years writing music software at started at Gracenote and worked there for seven years. I was doing engineering, playlist technologies, and then I moved into professional services where I got to work with lots of companies all around the world, including a lot of large companies in Germany like BMW and Nero. Um, after that, I worked with Double Twist, who wrote music software that let you connect your music and video and photos to any sorts of devices, not just iTunes and the Apple ecosystem. After that, a few friends convinced me to start Donna, and now I work at Yahoo writing communication software. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Donna, why we decided it was a good time to write an app like this. Now, our motivation was that these devices are now capable of so many things that were not possible a few years ago, yet we find ourselves doing the same actions over and over again. So we wanted to make an app that would help um, bring some of this information to you. So make a predictive assistant that doesn't need you to interact with it, but would rather present information to you right when you need it. Um, we're often, when we started, we are often compared to things like Siri. Uh, one big difference is that Siri is sort of a pull model. You talk to it and ask Siri for some information. Siri provides you back information. Donna, on the other hand, tries to figure out, based mostly on your calendar, on your current location, and on other data that it can retrieve, what information you need right now and when to present it to you. Our goal was to reinvent calendar, not just to take a calendar app and make it better than an existing calendar app, but to make it different. So a calendar app today will show you, what are my appointments today? And our, a personal assistant, we like to imagine if you had the best personal assistant possible, would instead tell you, here's what you need to know today. So the kinds of things you need to know are, these are my appointments, who are they with, how am I getting there? And then it's also very action-based rather than information-based. So from right here from this screen, I see exactly what's next. I can hit one button and send a message that says I'm running late to all of the other attendees. Um, if you have the Uber app installed, I can call an Uber and get there if I'm running late. It'll tell me if the weather is interesting and if I should bring a sweater, for example. Some of the other use cases, our most loved one was the notification of the time to leave. So it would go and fetch traffic information for you, figure out if there was additional traffic, if you needed to leave earlier, and send you a notification when you needed to leave or 10 or 15 minutes before. You could get more information about the location, see it on a map. It would pull the Google Street View image of your destination and let you communicate. And then if there is some communication information inside it, we would also do things like parse the location and the notes to see if there's a phone number, if there's a conference call code, if there is GoToMeeting or WebEx, and allow the user to, with one swipe, dial right into that conference rather than having to also open your invitation. Sometimes you have to go to your address book. Sometimes you have to look at the meeting and then enter the code. 
So we just wanted to simplify all of that and reduce the friction in doing these things that you do every single time you have a meeting. So now let me tell you a little bit about the company. The company was called Incredible Labs, and we actually decided on the company before we decided what we were going to do. It was, um, the idea was my friend Scott. I worked with him at Grace Note, and he's been a friend of mine for nearly 20 years. Um, he was the founder and the one who really set the values for our company and, and convinced me after months and months of asking me to start a company with him that we should start a company. This is me. We've talked about me already. Um, this is my friend Spence. I wasn't ready to start a company with Scott because I wasn't sure we could do it, just the two of us. But then my friend Spence, who I worked with at Double Twist, and 10 years before that I worked with him at Grace Note. He also owns a bar, plays jazz music, and has a record label, and is one of the best programmers I know. He said, hey, I heard you guys were thinking about starting a company. I want to start a company with you. Suddenly there were three of us, and I thought it was a good idea. I also had a friend named Kevin. Kevin had a, a few months before had left Twitter, and he'd been wanting to start a company, so I suggested we talk to him. Um, Kevin, within a day of talking to us, decided he wanted to start a company with us because the kind of company we wanted to start was the kind of company he wanted to start. So when Scott talked to Kevin, he said, I'm going to tell you about the product, but first I want to tell you about the company. And this is because with 20 years of experience, we decided it was very important to us to make the company that we would want to work for. So we really put that first. What was important to us was the people we wanted to work with, the, um, and also treating them well, treating them like people and not just like employees. I don't know if this is as big a deal in Germany, but um, to us there's really a big difference in how companies treat their employees. Um, and then we, what was important was the product. We wanted to build something that we would use every day. So solve a pain point. Our pain point was, I don't want to open four apps to get the same information every time. We wanted to provide value quickly, so it was important to us for an app to, the first time you install it and launch it, show the user something valuable. So, for example, we chose to use the calendar that is already a synchronized on the phone rather than asking you to connect to your Exchange server or connect to your Google server because then you, we can immediately pull data that you're already used to seeing on your phone. Um, it was important to engage with the users very well, so give them real, really easy and good opportunities to send feedback and to give us enough information to act on that feedback. Um, also metrics, we use third-party services such as Mixpanel and Flurry to collect information so we could tell how users were using our app and so we could adjust for that. Community support, I believe, was very important. So today this means having a really good Twitter presence that actually responds to users, having a Facebook page, having a good website, that kind of thing. Um, it can turn people who vocally hate your product into people who are fans of your product within a day if you just respond to them and make it sound like they're being listened to, and I think that was a valuable lesson. This is our timeline. Um, I won't tell you all of the details, but in October 2011, we decided to start a company. By January 2012, we had funding. Actually, I think on December 31st, we had signed the agreement. Um, we are funded by, mostly by Kosla Ventures, which is a big VC firm. It's not exactly who we expected to be funded by. We are going for smaller angel investors, but they were the ones who had enough money to try something experimental. One of our disadvantages when we looked for money was that none of us had started a company before. We'd all worked closely with people who'd started a company, but smaller investors were a little hesitant to give money to someone who hadn't started a company before, although it's possible. Nobody says no. A lot of people just don't quite say yes. They say, come back to me when you have a lead investor. So as soon as Kosla showed up and had a lead investor, then suddenly we had eight more smaller investors that we maybe didn't even need at the time, but we accepted them for strategic reasons. 
In April 2013, we finally launched the app. And I think this was critical. I think this was probably our biggest failure that we took that long to actually launch it. We were testing a lot. We were making design changes a lot because we cared quite a bit about the design. And so we didn't have a full, we had beta launches along the way, but we didn't have a full product that we were going to be proud to launch until April 2013. And then um, that summer we started realizing that we were going to need more money to continue doing this. We still had quite a bit, but we, um, that summer was also what became known as the Series A crunch. So it's really easy to get seed money, well not really easy, but in Silicon Valley nowadays, to get money to start. Um, and it was especially easy for us because we had the network and we had, um, um, we, we had a team full of engineers. But then one of the disadvantages of taking so much money early on is that when you go for your next round of funding, that number has to be a lot bigger. And that means whoever you're asking for money has to trust that you're going to be the winner in this space. When we started, we were the, one of the few companies that were talking about a personal assistant. But by midsummer 2013, Siri had been announced, Google Now had been announced, and there were some smaller players like Sunrise and Tempo, and it wasn't clear who was gonna win, so it was looking harder than ever to get money. So we also started being open to the idea of acquisitions, and we talked to a lot of companies. As soon as you open the door for one company, then you pretty much have to talk to a dozen companies. You have to do interviews, and interviews are some of the hardest part um, because they're interviewing your entire team of people. But eventually we settled on going with Yahoo's offer. Yahoo, um, we liked their vision, we liked where they were going, and I can talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, and they made us a pretty nice offer that, wanted us, that, that made us want to work for them. So, a year after we started, this was us. We went from four people to 11. We had operations people. We had two data scientists. We had a growth hacker. And we'd hired a full-time designer, finally. That was one of the hardest people to hire. Um, and then in June, we launched. This is us. We'd hit 10,000 users soon after we launched. By the end, we were at about 60,000. But 10,000 wasn't enough to go around asking for a lot of money, unfortunately. So here's what was fun. In retrospect, I mean, I don't regret a moment of it because even though it didn't end with us making a million dollars or being an Instagram-like acquisition, we got to build the company with people we, the, the company we wanted to work for with the people we wanted to work with. We had the freedom to innovate and to use the latest technologies. Sometimes when you end up working in an established company, you don't get to do things that use the latest technologies because you're working a lot with legacy technologies. Here's what's difficult, getting funding. Finding good people, even though we, we found some, it's, it's really difficult and hiring's very important, so important that I'm gonna talk about it a little bit in a second. Making deadlines, I think our issue with, the, with this was that we came from, um, most of us had come from organizations that had a waterfall approach, but we were really trying to adopt an agile approach where uh, we weren't as strict about deadlines and we were more about just working on the most um, important thing at the time. Making money. I think we just wanted to make a good product and we didn't really, we talked a little bit about how we could make money in the future, but really we wanted adoption, we wanted users, we wanted traction. So we didn't focus much on what our revenue plan was going to be. Um, stability and quality was important. We weren't good at this at first, but in a year when we adopted some new engineering processes, we got really good at this, and we used third-party services to track our crashes and to get user feedback, and that helped a lot. Um, marketing is, of course, really important, and um, we did some of the traditional marketing, but 
Near the end of last year, I think we discovered that we should have gone a little further with our marketing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here's what helped us get started. Our network helped us get started. Um, having Kevin, who had come from Twitter, and he became kind of famous when Jack Dorsey took over, and then Jack Dorsey fired a bunch of product managers, and then they all became instantly famous. Um, so having that network really helped us open doors and conversations. Location, being in San Francisco not only helps you talk to investors that are nearby, but it really attracts top talent. And um, maybe here, that's Berlin in Germany, but uh, San Francisco was, was really a draw for a lot of people. And there are companies like Google's opening a bigger office in San Francisco, Twitter's in San Francisco. I think Facebook has plans to open an office in San Francisco, and Yahoo is now opening a huge office in San Francisco. And they're doing this because people want to work there. Starting with an experienced team really helped us get money at the beginning, um, having not just the idea people and visionaries, but also engineers on this experienced team. Um, a lot of people go and pitch to investors before they have their engineering team, and I, I believe that's a bit harder. We also chose really good advisors, and we used our advisors to interview people even, and um, that helped us a lot. Uh, um, we hired our friends, and we had really good hiring practices. What helped us build a great product? We had designers. Um, I do think we designed a bit too much, but it really was critical to setting us apart from some of the other um, products that were like us. Hackathons, I think, really helped us. It makes the, um, and I'm delighted to see that you guys have them too, it, it really helps the innovation come out and has, have the engineers sort of step away from their day-to-day -day bug fixing tasks and, and look at the newest technologies and that makes everybody excited, really. We had great brainstorming sessions and off-sites, and I recommend things like that. And I think Mobile Solutions Day is an example of how you can implement that kind of thing in a big company. We had a lot of user testing, and we find, found creative ways to do that for very cheap. There are actually companies that help you do that. We had good user feedback. And I'm glad we chose a single platform, iOS, at the beginning, um, just to not sort of separate our attention. We did have plans to do Android very soon after, but we never got there. In running the company, I'm glad we hired wisely, that we kept promoting our values. We chose one platform. We asked lots of questions of our advisors, of our friends who had started companies. Um, we brainstormed well, and we held off-sites. Technically, I'm glad we used modern tools and processes um, that really sped up development. And this is something that's harder in large companies, too. So I think encouraging people to use modern tools is very important. Um, I'm glad we did user testing, feedback, and metrics, and community support. I already talked a bit about those. For metrics, we used Mixpanel um, and Flurry. But Mixpanel is very powerful, and it's nearly real time. It lets you segment your users. And it can even do powerful things like send notifications so you can send notifications based on a segment of your users. You can find all your users who haven't used the app in seven days and say, hey, would you like to come back and use our app? We've missed you, um, things like that. Crash reporting was really valuable. There are always situations where, in our environment, none of us would find crashes. But it turns out that there were people out there who were crashing if they locked their phone and then ran out of battery and then traveled. So you know we couldn't detect things like that in our situations. So I recommend having a good crash reporting system like Crashlytics or Criticism. For user feedback, this is what our user feedback screen looked like. We wanted to make it easy to get to. And you'll notice that there's an attached diagnostic information button. This sent screenshots of the last two things you were looking at, as well as a log of what had happened recently. And that meant we could get feedback and not just start a long communication with the user trying to figure out what happened, but we may have enough information to diagnose the problem. Now, now I want to talk a little bit about hiring. I thought this was, we learned a lot about hiring. Um, 
There's a book called Hire With Your Head that somebody recommended to us. Now, we, we all read this, and some of the valuable lessons we learned from this are, I think I'll summarize it by saying that they had 10 categories. For each category, they had um, how to differentiate whether somebody was a one, two, three, four, or five. Now, hopefully, you're never even getting ones in front of you because they should be pre-screened out. But a two is someone who can do the job. You're convinced they can do the job. And I think in previous companies, I would have hired twos quite often. A three is somebody who's going to do the job but surprise you and innovate and figure out better and faster ways to do the job. And what you're trying to do during the interview process is differentiate between the twos and the threes and only hire the threes. We also had our friends and advisors interview for us. We didn't have expertise in data science, but we had an advisor who did. So that gave us a lot of credibility with the best data science candidates. We even went to a graduate career fair at Stanford University, and we hired a graduate out of there. Um, for some of the things, since we didn't have the perfect engineers while we were waiting to find them, we hired contractors. Um, interns, I really like hiring interns at larger companies. I'm not sure that we had the bandwidth to deal with them in a smaller company because they need a, quite a bit more direction. Here's a quote I got from Mark Suster. He's a VC who actually writes a lot of articles that are helpful to um, people starting companies. I, I really recommend his blog. It's called Both Sides of the Table. And succinctly, he said, the problem is that A players are only attracted to work at places where they see other A players. They smell B from a mile away. Also, B players hire C people. A begets A, B begets C. And I think I've seen this everywhere. So if you have top talent, you will attract more top talent. And so you should really have high standards about who you hire. Now I want to talk a little bit about marketing virality. Um, we did some of the normal press marketing, and then we even got surprised by some press. Like there was an article in the Wired blog, and there was an article in People magazine that had a screenshot of Donna at the bottom. Personal assistants were in. So we did good on that part. Virality. Virality is where you have a feature that, as it benefits the user who's using it, there's a way to engage other friends, and the user sees the value they would get if other friends also use the feature. So we didn't do enough of this. We did some things like we, we prompted the user to help us out. Please tell a friend so I can keep working for you. Um, Near the end, we added a sharing location feature, which um, helped you sh automatically share your location with the friends who were in the same appointment with you. And then um, if you told them you were running late, there was a link so they could also download Donna. And that helped a little. I think we could have done more things like that, and I would recommend it. Um, marketing is a bit different now, and we found some valuable tools at the end. One of the most valuable ones we found was the kind of marketing that Facebook lets you do. So I'd recommend looking into Facebook if you can. And um, one example of some powerful marketing we could do with Facebook is they will let you build a custom audience based on their algorithms of what people are similar to other people. So we could just feed them a list of 500 email addresses. Facebook would figure out who they are and then create a custom audience of people who had similar interests and then let you market to them. And then in their Facebook stream, it would show you, it would show them um, an app to install Donna. Another valuable thing is we could find people who liked a page about a similar product, say Evernote, and then it would then target those people, and that was really a high click-through for a low price for us. So next time, some of the things I would repeat. First, I learned this from Kevin, don't turn down meetings. A lot of, even our initial funding and a lot of the best things that happened and the best people we met just came from meeting anybody who wanted to talk to us. Hire with your head. Maybe that means read the book, but really be, um, strict about hiring and about the types of questions you ask 
and about calling references. That was very important too. Um, start off with good engineering processes. It's easy in a small company to be sloppy about this because there are only four of you and you're all sitting next to each other, but it really helped us once we adopted them. Pick an idea that new technologies enable. This is really powerful when you talk to investors. Things like, I heard you talking about iBeacons, location-based technologies. Have a strong and responsive online presence. Um, design, user testing, offsites and brainstorming, I talked about these. Location and treat employees well. Here's what I would do differently. I'd pick a smaller minimum viable product. I think just making calendar experience bigger. Maybe it sounded small to us at the beginning, but there were, you know, it involved also things like figuring out how to get traffic, how to get, um, how to synchronize the calendar data, how to um, figure out all of the different communications that you might do with those people. Anyway, for a small company, I would have picked a smaller minimum product. Um, growth Hacker, we had one of these. This is the person who would help figure out what the users are doing and how to um, get more users and market to them. Um, but we got ours too early, or maybe we launched too late. Um, more marketing, more virality. A monetization plan, this is important not only when you're trying to get more money, but also when you're trying to be acquired because your value is higher if you're making money, of course. Um, Perhaps I would take, I would do fewer major design iterations. I think we had four before we launched and that's too many. I would take less money, I think, and maybe different money. Although it kind of made sense at the time to take what we took, but when, when it came to looking for more money, it, it, it was actually a disadvantage that we'd taken so much in the beginning. There's a quote that is sometimes attributed to to Voltaire, perfect is the enemy of good, and I think that's what we suffered from. We were trying to make it perfect. And there's a quote by my friend Rod, who is the founder of Soch. If you're not embarrassed by it, you've waited too long. He said that to me on Twitter. <laughs> now I'll talk a little bit about acquisitions quickly. We were acquired by Yahoo in December. Now, um, Yahoo is, um, so Yahoo's been around for 19 years, so before we started talking to them, I wouldn't have even considered that that would be a good candidate. But what I've seen even during the interview process and um, since we got there is they've actually been modernizing a lot of things, and the current CEO, Marissa Meyer, is very engineering focused, whereas the last four were very business focused. I think um, they've been giving people the freedom to try new things, and to not be encumbered by the old technology and to feel like, and to do things that demonstrate that the new things you try will be acknowledged, will be rewarded, and will be rolled out into products. And they do this partially by hackathons. That was one of the things that impressed me. We saw a hackathon the first week we were there. So I'm glad there that you guys are doing that. And um, you know, Yahoo's also noticing what's appealing to people in the Bay Area. It's, well, one, it's competing on money because Google and Facebook are just paying ridiculous amounts of money, but also location and benefits and things. So I think those are the kinds of things that have really been attracting some top talent to Yahoo. And Yahoo's doing acquisitions mostly just to get talent more than the product itself. Some of them are the product, but that's, where they see the entrepreneurs are there, the people who are designing the new apps, the ones that are gonna get in the user's hands and use the newest technology. And they've spent a lot of the last uh, two years doing about 40 acquisitions. And they're slowing down now, but we're one of the last ones that came in. Um, that's all I had today. I think I went a little over time, I'm sorry, but thank you. And finally, um, for Thursday, good luck. I hope it'll be an interesting game.